And what we're going to do first is before I introduce Mr. Dave Warner and Lieutenant Commander Nick uh, Stampelli, I'm going to go ahead and Stampley, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give Lieutenant Chelsea Dietlin an opportunity to give a quick plug for the Navy Blue Angels program. Uh, we're so excited that next month she's actually going to be presenting um, a longer presentation about the Navy Blue Angels. But in the meantime, I would like to give her about one to three minutes to go ahead and talk a little bit about the program and what the upcoming uh, application process is if you are interested in becoming a Blue Angels PAO. So over to you, Chelsea. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's uh, Lieutenant Chelsea Dietland here. Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction. Um, thanks, everyone, for a few minutes here. Uh, kind of relevant timely wise, uh, timeliness wise, uh, we have our application uh, process uh, kind of underway here. The message, the hiring message for the PAO position just dropped here on uh, February 11th. So we'll be looking to replace me for the upcoming uh, season next year. So the 2022-2023 show seasons with the Blue Angels. Um, and we're starting the application process right now. The NAV admin for the PAO is uh, 0321. Um, and we're looking for kind of a senior lieutenant, junior uh, lieutenant commander to fill this role. Ideally, two tours, two public affairs tours under your belt um, or equivalent civilian public affairs experience prior to uh, your time with the Navy. Um, we're also looking for junior or I'm sorry. Yeah, more junior enlisted, also chief enlisted personnel. We're going to be hiring a uh, chief, uh, an E6, so an LPO for our shop and also an E5. So if you know uh, any JO, PAOs who would make a good fit for the role, uh, as well as enlisted MC uh, types, uh, please send them our way. Applications for MCs uh, will be due May 5th officers are April 31st. So within the same uh, short time frame there and the enlisted NAV admin is 28120. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, uh, please, or if you are interested or if you know uh, anyone who might be interested in applying, please reach out. I'm in the global chelsea.deetlin at navy.mil uh, and like uh, Lieutenant Commander Carpenter had said, I'll be talking more about the program as well as some of the, the cool stuff we've been able to do um, this past year and uh, what kind of the next few years looks like. Um, so thank you so much for the time and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chelsea. And I'm really excited to talk to you more about the Blue Angels program. It's not a part of the Navy that I know much about. So I look forward to hearing about some of the initiatives that you guys have done in the areas of uh, communications and some of your operational activities. So I think that's going to be a really awesome presentation. So thanks so much for joining us. So now we're going to get into our program, and I have two amazing guests uh, to talk about a very important issue. So I'm going to briefly describe their background, then I'm going to start off by asking uh, our uh, Nick a couple questions, and then pivot over to Dave, and we'll go back and forth with a few questions, and then we'll leave some time at the end for uh, the audience to ask questions as well. We want this to be an open discussion. So first off, uh, we have a uh, retired captain, uh, Mr. Dave Warner. Now he has 30 years of experience in public affairs. I'm sure many of you know him already. He is, worked at the, after the Navy, he worked at the Historical Center, he's done PAC Fleet. And his current role is the Assistant Chief of Information for Requirements, Policy and Professional Development. He supports the public affairs and visual information enterprises, ways and means. And if any of you don't know who Dave Warner is, uh, you should, because he was the guy on Twitter for a lot of years when Twitter was first getting started. And uh, he was also a uh, Shorty Awards finalist 
as that Navy Twitter author, and he uh, was assigned to the USS Carl Vinson Carrier Battle Group, where they launched the ship's first web presence on the eve of Operation Desert Strike in the Arabian Gulf. So just a, just a plethora of experience, and I'm so glad that he's on the call with us today. Uh, my second guest is Lieutenant Commander Nick Stampfley. And Nick has an amazing amount of experience as well. He, uh, he's from Olympia, Washington, so near where my husband is from. Uh, he's currently assigned to the Legal Assistance Department head at Region Legal Service Office, Mid-Atlantic, Norfolk. Uh, he's done tours in Iraq. He served as the Chief of Operational Law and Rule of Law Coordinator for Multinational Force West, where he qualified as a Fleet Marine Force Officer. He's also served as an Admiralty Attorney he was the fleet uh, staff judge advocate for Commander St Carrier Strike Group 12. He's also been the acting uh, fleet judge advocate for U.S. Second Fleet. So he's he worked on COVID-19 relief efforts, including the Navy's mission in New York City. So just a very uh, well-respected uh, uh trial lawyer, and uh, we're just so pleased to have him on the call. So what I'd like to do now is go ahead and I want to get started by asking uh, Nick a couple questions to just kind of frame what we'll be discussing, which are um, outside activities uh, for military members, but more specifically for Navy PAOs. And when I say Navy PAOs, I do mean those in uniform who are on active duty. So we won't get into some of the other rules that apply uh, to contractors or civilians. So this is geared towards active duty, but let's go ahead and get started. Nick, I'd like to know if you could summarize the policies regarding political activity online. Great, thanks, thanks, Teresa. And, and let me just start out, uh, first of all, I see some familiar names, so, so good to see all of you. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is, you know, is really more education and not legal advice about any particular person situation. So you know, standard disclaimer, if, if you have a question about something you're dealing with at work or maybe something a friend is dealing with or something you're concerned about, you need to take that up your chain of command to your actual staff judge advocate. But um, I'm happy to talk about the rules and uh, things in a broader sense. So summarizing the rules, uh, I, I think probably the two most important references for folks the most recent one is NAV Admin 213 TAC 20, 213 TAC 20, uh, which came out in July of 2020. Uh, subject being public affairs policy guidance concerning political campaigns and elections. And what's interesting about that is A, it's the most recent guidance, but B, it also includes information on social media and use of social media in paragraph three, um, which basically says, and I'll just read what it says. In general, all federal employees and active duty members may use social media and email to express their own personal views on public issues or po political candidates, as much as the same as they might write a letter to the editor of a newspaper. If a social media site or post identifies that member as a person on active duty, or if the member is otherwise reasonably identifiable as an active duty member, then the entry must clearly and prominently state that the views expressed are those of the individual only and not those of the DOD or DON. Uh, active duty members may friend, like, follow uh, social media accounts of political parties and partisan issues, campaigns, elections, things like that. However, you cannot encourage people to like, endorse, follow, or any of, any of those sorts of things. So, uh, you know, the way I like to think about that, right, is, is when President Trump was in office, uh, frequently we'd get uh, direction from Twitter. And so a lot of people had a reason to follow him or like him on Facebook. It didn't necessarily mean um, that they were endorsing his campaign or his reelection, but uh, you are allowed to follow public figures and, and candidates for office to, to learn about what they're doing. You just can't campaign for them or encourage other people to do it. The other uh, policy guidance I think is really important that everyone needs to be aware of is a DOD Directive 1344 Point one zero, uh, and that is the subject of that is political activities by members of the armed forces. So this is the baseline directive for uh, people on active duty about what you can and can't do when it comes to parties and elections and, and people running for office. Uh, here's the interesting thing about that. It, it's dated February 19th, 2008. So the last time it was updated was uh, in the Bush administration. Uh, there's been a lot of changes with Twitter and, and Facebook and things like that in that amount of time. So 
I would imagine that there's going to be an update to that instruction sometime soon. I just, I don't know when, and I, I'm not even really sure if there's something in the works. Um, but, but that's a really useful item because it, it contains a list of do's and don'ts. And, you know, I've, I've tried to summarize that for people before, and there's a number of lists going out there that you can see. But, but just for example, some of the things you're allowed to do as a uniform member on active duty, right? You can register to vote, you can vote, you can express a personal opinion to friends or family members on political candidates or issues. You can promote and encourage other people to vote in general, like, you know, register to vote, not vote for this particular person or, or candidate. You can join a uh, political club and attend its meetings, but not in uniform. You can serve as an election official uh, with the approval of the Secretary of the Navy. That would be like, you know, sign, make sure people sign their ballots or, or whatever when they go to vote. You can sign a petition as a private citizen. You can write a letter to the editor expressing your personal views if you include the disclaimer. You can make monetary contributions to a political organization, party, or committee. You can display one bumper sticker, and that's one on your car uh, for a, a candidate. Uh, you can attend a partisan or even a nonpartisan fundraising activity, rally, debate, convention activity as a spectator, not in uniform, and you can't really participate or, or endorse as part of that. Uh, and you can participate, and this is something we should all do, you can participate in the federal voting assistance program. Things that you cannot do if you're on active duty. Uh, you cannot fundraise for a candidate. You can't participate in fundraising activities, uh, doing more than just being a mere spectator. You can't use your official office, your authority, or your influence to uh, interfere with an election, solicit votes, or solicit contributions. You cannot publish partisan political art articles, letters, or endorsements that solicit votes. You cannot serve in any official capacity with a partisan political club. That would be more than just you know, attendance or, or membership. You cannot speak before a partisan political gathering or a gathering that promotes a partisan political cause. You cannot participate in any radio, television, or other program as an advocate for or against a partisan political party, candidate, or cause. You and cannot... Go ahead. I was just going to say, and I really want to point out that this says cause as yeah. well. So these political activities, a cause could mean a nonprofit. A cause can mean so many things. So I, I think that's important yeah. distinction. Yeah, and, and most of this list, it goes on uh, partisan issues, right? So, so a Democrat or Republican issue, an uh, issue that's so closely tied with that, that party uh, that, that you know it's, it's, it's part of their platform or candidate, right? When we're talking about the success or failure of a candidate in an election. Now that's different than say, writing a letter to the editor expressing your views on uh, firearm regulation or um, whaling. Uh, you know, those might have a, a political link to them or environmentalism maybe mm -hmm. uh, that have, you know, one, one party might feel differently about this issue than the other party. But, but that's different than promoting the, you know, vote for the Republican Party because they believe in X, Y, and Z, right? That is, that, that's what they're talking about when they get to partisan political activities. So that, that's a short version of the list. The long version of the list is in that instruction. You'll note that it doesn't really give you any guidance on social media. It doesn't tell you what you can or can't say on Twitter or, or, or what you can put on your Facebook wall because in 2008, they weren't thinking of that when they wrote this thing. So that's why that NAV admin that came out earlier this summer um, really talks about how far you're able to go in liking or following someone. Awesome, thank you so much, Nick. And now we're gonna get into how does this affect us as PAOs? So uh, Dave, we have active duty PAOs who have podcasts. We have some who have YouTube channels. Um, we have some who write books. Uh, what do you recommend that they keep in mind if they wanna be a content creator in a personal capacity? Uh, well, first, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to see a lot of faces out there and, uh, or names of faces. Uh, so it's great to see everybody and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm gonna give you an opinion. I'll pull from uh, experience and my, what I've gleaned from what I've read but it's one person's opinion. Like the JAG said, if you really want official review of your particular case, go see a professional, get it in writing. So uh, the recommendations I would have, particularly for those that wanna be podcasters or bloggers, uh, and it transcends social media. These are basic best practices for public affairs officers. Don't surprise your boss. 
And by that, if you're going to go out and do something, even if it's for free, uh, but if it's in social media, especially, you're going to want to get what I would get is what's called a moonlighting affidavit. Uh, all that does is say, hey, boss, I'm going to do this. It may result in money. It may not. But it spells out what you plan to do apart in a personal capacity, apart from what you're doing professionally. Uh, but before I go up to my boss, I'm going to do a couple of other things to make sure that I've crossed the T's and dotted the I's. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is make sure whatever content I hope on creating and representing in my own personal brand or my own personal interest comports with law policy directives. You know, you take an oath of office. Does it, is it in step with that? The U.S. Constitution, have I reviewed that? And that's pretty important these days. Uh, Navy regulations, we're given very specific stipulations, painting with a broad brush, but Navy regulations kind of kind of paints that picture for you. UCMJ uh, articles, 88, 89, 91, 92, 120B, 120C, 133, 134. Uh, if you go to the uh, social media handbook that OI2, Chris Madden and Crystal and his team put together, that lays all this out. Uh, you'll remember that we've had some issues with Marines United and some other uh, pervasive things where people didn't do what integrity would call for. You know, integrity is doing the right thing, even when you don't think people are looking. Uh, don't forget DOD principle, uh, uh, DOD's principles of information and uh, uh, our good friend, the JAG, JAG Nick brought up uh, political activities, the uh, DD, uh, DOD Directive 1344. So you go through, you're going to create a blog or video blog, and you think it comports with all that and that you can manage that. A couple of other things that I would think about uh, that uh, should uh, that you should weigh. One is understand the inferences drawn by what content you're creating and what you are implying by virtue of putting it out there, uh, particularly for personal brands, things like that. One is, uh, one thing I like to say is there's no I in team. This, by the way, none of this is to discourage you. These are things to think about richly as a public affairs officer. And I'll talk about that, my interpretation of what that means uh, later but there's no I in team. Remember the gravity of your public affairs position, the, the company you work for uh, and dealing with industry and reporters. If you are putting out content or a story or a brand that doesn't align neatly with what it is you do on behalf of the Department of Navy and more broadly the US government, Department of Defense, um, you, kind of got to look at that hard because you've raised your hand and said 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the length of my commitment, I'm going to be a naval officer and a spokesperson, two different uh, considerations. Uh, and you need to make sure that you are fully on board with doing that. Uh, remember that you are paid to convey publicly the Navy's position on a number of issues. Uh, you shouldn't voice a personal opinion that implies or could be inferred to contradicting that position. If you do, it makes you a hypocrite. And by extension, it kind of makes all of our jobs as PAOs a little bit more difficult uh, because then people are like, well, that's, they're just a paid flack uh, as opposed to, hey, look, we're naval officers. This is our position and this is what we defend. So it's, it's hard to have it both ways. Uh, Another consideration is depending on the nature of your duty. Some of us have nice cushy office positions. I'm looking at myself where I, and I'm, I'm not a uniform member, so it's a little different. Uh, but if you're on deployment or you are in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or you know, 24 seven where you're surrounded by government equipment, government responsibilities, people standing watch, do you have your own time to do this kind of personal stuff? It's not a, it's, it's something to think about uh, when you're putting together this content. Uh, another one is a, a standard go-to is the Washington Post test. If you were to make this fully known and the Washington Post were to do a story, could they poke holes in it? Could they find fault with what you're doing? Um, if the answer is no, they couldn't, you know, I like to cook and I'm doing some stuff on cooking and it's a, it's a hobby of mine, I'm just sharing it online, okay? It probably isn't going to run afoul of any of those things we've already talked about. Uh, once you've done all that, think about then running the traps with your command, 
your commanding officer, your JAG, your local neighborhood JAG, and then probably higher headquarters public affairs as well and say, hey, look, I'm thinking about doing this, you know, kind of get some puts and takes. Again, don't surprise the boss. And in our case, it's your boss command, you know, light inside your lifelines, and it's the PA community because we have a lot of different things and want an outside, uh, an outside look. Uh, if, you, if that gets the thumbs up, uh, something else I would do, and I did it when I did Twitter, and, and so you know, when I started the Twitter account at the media center, I didn't ask permission because I didn't want to know the answer, but I felt confident in what I was doing. Uh, it wasn't my personal brand. It was technically the Navy brand. We just didn't get approval for it, but I did have a mentor, and I did have a couple of people who kept me on the straight and narrow. I felt I was leaning a little too far forward. I would, I would get a second read, uh, but seek mentorship. Somebody that is already doing that, get a sense for what works, what doesn't. Do some research, know what you're doing in that medium if you're gonna use it. And then to the extent you can do this, before you finally go to that chain command with that piece of paper saying, boss, this is what I'm doing. I understand I won't do these things. Can you sign here? Uh, try to do a beta test, You know, particularly for something that requires a little bit of your time and energy and creative, uh, know-how and technical know-how. Uh, try to see if you can kick the tires before you commit to it. You ain't nothing worse than committing to it and finding out uh, way harder or I'm not effective or I don't have the tools necessary. So do all those things. Then you start at the beginning. Go get that moonlighting affidavit. Go get that permission slip. Get it signed. Keep it current and move out. And then, uh, you know, folks will let you know, you know, if you have catastrophic success. Uh, the higher you go, the more visible you become. Uh, so those are uh, great ways to get validation. So anyway, that's what, uh, that would be my two cents, Commander. Excellent answer. And if you would like to know uh, these moonlighting affidavits, uh, I have a copy here that I've printed out. Uh, it was actually from uh, OI1. So your chain of command sh uh, legal office should have something like this but this is a Im very important letter. And it, it, I will note too that it says outside activities. So this doesn't just mean paid employment. This could mean a volunteer uh, opportunity within a nonprofit. And I think this is incredibly important uh, to have and something that I just recently learned about. So I, I encourage you, if you have these outside activities, uh, you, you do exactly what uh, Mr. Warner said and you go through those wickets and bring it up with your chain of command. So some of the questions that I had here, you guys already answered, but I'm going to take one question that I think is a little bit of a harder question. And I'd like to ask both of you, and you guys, I think, already know it's coming. But what I'd like to know is that we, we currently are seeing a lot of active duty military members in uniform uh, having an online persona. So, and when I say online persona, I mean a YouTube page, or they're putting out videos on LinkedIn about lessons learned in uniform. They're, they're doing all these things. And while there may not be selling a product, some are. Some do have brand deals, some don't. And I just want to know uh, from Nick, your perspective, and then I'm going to get your perspective, Dave. What do you think of that? Um, I think my exact question was, what constitutes using one's position of influence in the Navy with affiliation with a cause or a product? Hey, thanks, Teresa. And I'm going to do the lawyer thing and, and look you all confidently and not say it depends. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, and the mood lighting thing is, is great, right? Because... Um, the Navy has paid for 100% of your time, right? You, you are, you are a, a officer 24 seven. So, you know, this could be as simple as, and I see people screw this up all the time, driving for Uber or Lyft, right? You're not having a video blog or anything, but, but you're doing outside employment, you need to get permission for that. Um, but, but when we get to things like the stuff you're talking about, it might be a, a volunteer free, no pay involved, YouTube site, you probably should get permission for that too. But if if you're getting into endorsements or selling things, or maybe even you're selling your own, you know, on the side real estate practice or something like your Avon business or something like that, right? That's when the, the red flags and the danger warning should go up because there are ethics rules uh, put out by the Office of Government Ethics that cover uh, endorsements and, you know, moonlighting and all those sorts of things and the baseline rule that they always come back to is abuse of public office for private gain. Are people coming to your YouTube site because you're in uniform? 
are people willing to buy your uh, Avon soap because you're in uniform? And if you're doing that, that's usually where, where people get hung up. And, and I'll just give you all references an example. You can Google it. Um, it's fantastic. It's, it's put out by the DOD Standards of Conduct's Office. It's called the Encyclopedia of Ethical Failure. Uh, and it is 203 pages long, at least the current version is. And it gives examples of all the different ways that people have, have gotten hung up, maybe endorsing a product or getting pay outside of work or sending an email to friends saying sign up to, for first command or you know, one of those types of things. Um, generally, those are all no-nos and, and what the punishment might be would kind of depends case by case and it's up to the, the person enforcing the rules to decide you know, whether or not you're going to be suspended without pay or lose your commission or get a letter of reprimand. All right, over to you, Dave. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take the devil's advocate, and that is that as PAOs, we're on a high wire. Uh, our job is to engage publicly. Now, we have a lot of tools to do that. We have a lot of people manning, trained, equipped to tell the Navy story, and normally that can happen within the framework of those resources to include what we provide on social media, visual information, uh, you know, creatively presenting our content to an increasingly, ironically, remote audience, right? Everybody's entering these filter bubbles. How do we reach those engaged audiences? Uh, the truth is every day opportunities are mushrooming around us to reach them in authentic, credible ways. In 2007, 2008, that burgeoning technology was Twitter. And it was very simple to run and hide under a rock and say, we're not gonna do that. Uh, but by balancing risk, getting just enough creativity and recognizing the medium and my obligation, our obligation to communicate our content, the content I was sharing was already approved through a regularly approved uh, uh, means of approval through the Department of Navy, i.e. me <laughs> as the uh, CEO of Media Center, but that notwithstanding, but it was presented using a burgeoning technology that allowed me to put a credible authentic spin on what otherwise would be watching paint dry for much of that audience. And it gave us a voice and a responsiveness that allowed us to uh, to more effectively convey the Navy story and in a timely fashion. Uh, within a year or two with the launch of the Facebook page, now these are not personal accounts, but in the early going, it was personally managed uh, with respect to uh, uh, conveying the Navy story. Every day there are new uh, opportunities, new canvases on which we can paint the Navy story. Here's a challenge, particularly from a personal standpoint, uh, when you are sharing the Navy story, or maybe you're sharing your own content or, uh, you know, your own passion, it doesn't relieve us from Navy regs, UCMJ, your oath, the Constitution, uh, political activities. Those things still have to be met. It just means you have to be really creative and think about what you're doing. If you go back to that first response I gave and think through all those things and you can get to yes, then it's probably... It, could serve a, uh, a positive means for sharing the Navy when we are increasingly wrestling with how we reach 18 to 29 year old uh, women who just don't understand about the Navy or don't necessarily have a favorable opinion of the Navy. Same thing, people of color, how are we gonna reach them? Uh, there are other considerations in this as well that we should be leaders in understanding with mis, dis, and malinformation from Russia, perpetuating bad information or being taken advantage of, using, you know, trying to get TikTok in places where by virtue of uh, China's reach, maybe we're unnecessarily exposing ourselves. So that's not to say don't do it. It is to say, understand the landscape, understand the opportunity, understand the puts and take, uh, puts and takes and position yourself and the Navy and your people to be as opportunistic as the means for public disclosure allow. Uh, so there you go. Uh, we've said the same thing, just two different uh, approaches uh, to it. Yeah, if I could just revise and extend my remarks briefly. Um, 
I, I totally agree. There might be a great reason to get online in uniform uh, to tell the Navy story and, and do that on a non-standard channel. And that might be okay. And that's why I said at the beginning, it depends. The, the issue is really, where's that advertising money going? You know, are, are you, are you getting money for, for official duties? Because if you are, that might be a big problem. And I, again, I don't want to make a blanket statement for every yeah. case, but you definitely need to get someone to look at that if, if there's money involved. This kind of I, goes I, I find the reward, the work is reward enough is what I find. <laughs> this goes back to uh, Austin Alexander. He's a, he's a famous YouTube influencer and he's probably the most prominent out there, millions of followers. And you know, I, I only used him as an example because he does videos or he did videos. He's, he's now out of the Navy uh, in uniform. He had brand and endorsement deals on his page, um, but he did go through a legal review. And this gets back to your point, Dave, about us still needing people to tell our story. And sometimes it's more credible if that story comes from an influencer. Um, I guess I'm going to pivot back to you, Dave. What is it that you, you, what is your personal opinion on those kinds of cases? And, and, and how do you think that we as PAOs best navigate that for our sailors when they come to us and tell us they want to do a, a vlog or a YouTube page? Sorry, still, uh, still working the mute, on the mute uh, button. Uh, so I would say as leaders, as communicators, as professional communicators and representatives of the Navy, I think there are two things two framing points of view. And, and, you know, just now I really lean forward. Hey, you got to think creatively, look for opportunities to exploit sharing the story, but it assumes two framing considerations. First, we work for the Department of Navy, more broadly, the Department of Defense, uh, the U.S. government. The gravity of our institutions, the, the citizens of this nation allow us to go out and kill other people or to be killed by other people. The gravity of what it is we do and why we do it is significant. And we should always keep that in mind. Those that have been on deployments where you've launched tomahawks, where you've been in Iraq and had indirect fire, where you've gone out on patrols, uh, you know, those of us in the Pacific who've been on ships, on collisions or had to deal with that, it is literally life and death. And we should never let that fade too far from what it is we do and how we do it. The, the gravity. The second piece is as PAOs, we raise our hand, take an oath uh, to support and defend the Constitution. But as PAOs, we have the unique responsibility and opportunity for attribution to represent the Navy story. We convey that, we represent it, we defend it. And in my opinion, you can never say or do anything that would contradict or undermine that public position. Even if I don't believe it personally, I don't, I am paid to present the Navy's position on all these issues. Uh, so if that's the case, when somebody comes to me and says, hey, particularly in the MC or public affairs community, you have to recognize that you are holding not just your personal brand, not even your command brand, you are holding the reputation of the Navy in your hands. If, if the means of communicating and the means of exploitation using a certain personal communication or personal brand, personal channel, channel uh, could undermine that, then you have an obligation to, find, to, to uh, make a better mousetrap or to say, you know, maybe we don't do it this time. Uh, it's a really, it, it's, it's really important. We've seen, you know, the, the road to where we are is paved with lots of dead PAOs who lost that bubble, who thought they were doing the right thing and just became too insular in their thinking, uh, either for self gain or, or for whatever. So uh, that's how I would take it. Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, uh, yeah, I just, uh, that really resonated with me as a lawyer, uh, because I have, I have professional responsibilities, right? I've got clear rules about, you know, I can't use a client's confidences against that person. If someone tells me something in confidence so I can represent them, I can't, I can't use it against it, against the client. Um, in, in the sense, you guys, you, you are a profession too, right? And you have your own professional responsibility that's, that's 
integral to what you do. And so while you might not have clear written rules, uh, like I do from a Supreme Court, um, you still have guidelines and things you need to follow so you maintain your integrity as a PAO. And I, I think that's just really great advice. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Nick. Um, so now I think I've gone through all the questions that I have. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the audience. And I see that Lieutenant Commander Holland has her hand raised. So if you just guys have questions, please go ahead and raise your hands. And I will call you up in the order that you are receiving, the order as, you, as they come in. So over to you, Julie. Thanks, Teresa. Like Dave, I'm still trying to figure out the unmute button. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to share a quick um, lesson learned from my time at Third Fleet. Um, Captain Perry and I were up at Los Angeles Fleet Week, and um, I had gone to set up for, for the next event, and Captain Perry was approached by the Chief Selects wanting to do um, a push-up challenge. And it was during the Chief Select season, um, and they wanted to film it and then put it on the LA Fleet Week um, social media page. Um, at the time, we went right ahead, had, you know, Vice Admiral Tyson do the push-ups. It was supposed to highlight um, suicide awareness. Um, and while we thought, you know, great cause, great thing to bring attention to, what we didn't realize until maybe probably 12 hours later was that it was showing, you know, Admiral Tyson in uniform endorsing a non-Navy program. Um, and unfortunately, someone turned in an IG complaint immediately following that posting. Um, and so she was unfortunately put into a place where she couldn't do certain things in her job as the third fleet commander because she was being investigated um, by the IG. So just wanted to share that um, when you think that it could be a good cause, it's something that we should, you know, suicide awareness, you know, you'd think um, non-issue there, but it was for um, a, a company or a program that was uh, for money, you know, for fundraising. Uh, so just to be aware of those things and to ask those questions and don't think just on the fly, like, let, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Always bring in the JAG, because I'm sure if we had talked to the, the Third Fleet JAG, um, they would have said right away, it probably wouldn't be something that she should have participated in. Right. It goes back to it being a non-federal entity. It was outside of DOD and outside of, and it was, it doesn't matter if it's a nonprofit or a, or a corporation, it's an outside activity. Uh, when so Commander Holland started, when Commander Holland started that story, I thought she was going to be talking about deep fakes because we all know <laughs> RP can't do a push up. So I'm like, oh, here it comes, deep fake. But uh, uh, that's a great example. Thank you, Commander. All right. So I'm just. No, I was, I was just oh, sorry. Go ahead, the other one I thought it was the ice bucket challenge. That was another one that a lot of people got hung up on thinking, hey, this is a really good cause, but you know, the the road to hell is paved in good intentions, right? So so be careful. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions, so I just want to turn it over very briefly uh, to Commander Charlie Dre. He is my co-mentor for the Eastern Region Mentoring Group. So I want to just turn it over to him to say a few words as well. So go ahead, Charlie. Um, hey, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. All right. Well, I apologize. I had some technical difficulties, so I was a little late getting on the call. Um, but um, Nick and uh, Mr. Warner, just uh, just want to say thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to cover these important subjects and, you know, kind of the left, rights, and the rudder. It's, um, very, you know, very appreciative. Um, you know, um, with, with a lot of the things that are going on with social media, you know, we always got to remember that you're the naval officer and a PAO um, and you know if, if in doubt I've always followed the process of um, I'm way more conservative on my personal posts and things and that has kept me out of shoal water so I would just suggest to folks you know if there's something that gets your spider senses going um, then don't do it and always, 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 if you, you have questions, you know, there's a legal team for a reason, make sure that you're coordinating on things. And that, that just, you know, that, that's sound counsel to do that. Um, I just, I think this was a very good conversation and it's very timely. So I just wanna thank Teresa for, for setting this up. I wanna thank everyone for participating. And as I said, I wanna thank uh, you, Nick and Mr. Warner for, um, for taking the time to, to um, spend with us and cover these important subjects. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, 
If there's no more questions, I'm just going to turn it back over to Nick and Dave for some closing thoughts, and then I'll just put out a brief uh, plug again for Chelsea's uh, Blue Angels presentation for next month. So I'll start with uh, you, Nick, and then Dave, you'll, you can close it out. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Teresa, and, and thanks, everybody, for having me and for listening. Um, you know, as was just said, we're, we're on your side. We're here to help you. So uh, please don't wait till it's a problem. You know, the sooner you, you see us, the the easier we can make things go and hopefully uh, keep everyone out of trouble. So thanks. See you. Super. Well, again, uh, thank you, Commander. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. And it's great to see so many people. And uh, uh, one day when we're not being reported <laughs> over uh, your favorite, uh, over your favorite uh, beverage, we'll tell lots of sea stories, <laughs> lessons learned in blood. Uh, but in, in uh, departing here, a couple of things I'd throw in there. One is as PAOs, as leaders, you really have to live the example. And by live the example is uh, we get paid to engage the public and there are all kinds of opportunities. And with, with mushrooming opportunities also come mushrooming risks. So take a look at that, look out for your people, uh, monitor these channels just because you don't wanna participate or you're risk averse doesn't mean, you know, you're just gonna let somebody else monitor the stuff. You really have to be smart in these matters. Uh, so be creative, but be but uh, be careful. Stay current. Uh, I would say make sure that you are doing, you know, old media, Gutenberg media. Uh, you know, there are plenty of really good resources out there uh, that you can get smarter on and you can share that, uh, those lessons with other people, encourage that they read up on some of this. Uh, make sure that you stay aligned to the DOD U.S. government narrative. Um, it was a little harder in the last administration. Sometimes as a government, we weren't always on the same page. I don't think that's an issue now. And uh, for my Blue Angels uh, counterpart over there, uh, one more plug for that job. If any of you have seen that guy in a spiffy suit with his hair combed all nicely, uh, physically fit, Mr. John Kirby, a uh, Blue Angel PAO uh, Emeritas, five years as PAO for the Blue Angels. So uh, a potentially very professionally uh, uh, positive place to be and learn. So anyway, stay aligned, watch those DOD press briefs, understand what's going on around you. And when it comes to social media, if you find yourself becoming too passionate or too wrapped up or, or you just can't walk away from it, you need to ask yourself if being a public affairs officer and, you know, if that's really the right job for you, you know, that what PAOs do is different than what every other, you know, Benjamin second class Smith does not have the same responsibilities as, you know, a PAO. They may have their own personal opinions. They're not paid to carry the Navy's public affairs, uh, the Navy's public reputation. We are. So if you become so passionate and so, fixated on something that does not align with what the Department of Defense is doing and you don't feel you can uh, resist expressing it publicly, then take a look at whether or not you should be doing this for a living. Uh, you're, it just, I don't, we don't see it a lot, but in these politically charged and connected environments, it's more so uh, an issue than it has been in the past. So just think about it. So there you go. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to participate. Thank you so much, Nick and Dave. And uh, a lot of what you said, I think, uh, resonated uh, with the group. I know it resonated uh, very deeply with me personally. And I think that, as you said, uh, when we're not being recorded, uh, it's always good to have those uh, case studies that you talk about with your mentor, because there are plenty of case studies in the military uh, where this has gone incredibly wrong uh, with people who, who, like Nick said, had very good intentions, uh, but unfortunately, uh, their execution or their lack of knowledge on this issue uh, got them down a road that they should never have gone down to begin with. So really appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, like I said, this call is recorded. I'll provide a link uh, afterwards for those who missed it. And please join us next month. Uh, we're going to be having uh, Lieutenant uh, Dietlin come back. And uh, I can't wait to hear her talk more about the Blue Angels program, what they do. And uh, I'm really excited uh, to moderate that session. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll talk to you all later. Bye. <laughs>